So now I will talk about three important notations that we use to denote or to talk about the order of growth of functions or what we call or what we refer to as asymptotic notation. And these are three, three notations or three symbols that correspond to different bounds that we put on how, how fast or slow a function grows. And the first one of them, which is the most commonly used one, is what we call the big O. It's really the big letter O. And it is, the, it is asymptotically similar to less than or equal. So when I talk about a function f less than or equal g, then this is where I want to use the big O. So big O is used to put an upper bound, an upper bound on the function. And the definition here, basically, you can read it. It tells us that f of x is O of g of x. If there are two, posit two positive constants, c and k, such that f of x is smaller than or equal to c times g of x for all x greater than or equal to k. So how does this look visually? So suppose I have, this is x here, and suppose I have something like this, and I have a function like this here, okay? So let's look at this as f, f of x. If you look at this situation here, this is f of x and this is g of x, if you look at this, you will notice that for x greater than or equal to k, after this point here, we will see that f of x is smaller than or equal to g of x in this particular example. It is smaller than or equal to g of x. But as I said before, that if g of x is n squared or 5 n squared or 2 n squared, I don't want to distinguish between these two or these three of them. This is why we can also say that as long as I can bound it by a constant times that g of x. Again, if g of x is in x squared, you can take the constant to be 2, 3, 17, 5 million, whatever it is, to, to bound f of x from above. So this is, what, this is the situation of f being big O of g, that there is this constant k, k has to be greater than 0, there is a constant c that has to be greater than zero. They can both can be re they are both real numbers. Okay, so they can be fractions. They can be half or or one third and so on. After which, after we after, uh, so that we have a point k after which f of x will never grow faster than c times g of x. So this is the big O notation. Okay, so if I want to prove f of x is O of g of x. I really need to find a positive constant c, a positive constant k, and show that f of x is smaller than c times g of x for every x greater than or equal to k. So here, basically, we if you if we want to write if we want to write the big O definition using quantifiers, basically we say there exists a c, there exists a k such that for every x greater than or equal to k, f of x is smaller than or equal to c times g of x. So if I want to negate that, if I want to show that f of x is not o of g of x, so how do we negate a quantified formula like this? c times g of x. The negation of this, this basically tells us that for every constant c, for every constant k, there exists an x greater than or equal to k, such that not f of x smaller than or equal to c times g of x, or f of x is greater than c times g of x, okay? So if you want to show f is O of g, you need to find these two constants, c and k. If you want to show f is not O of g, then you need to show that for every constant c, for every constant k, you cannot show that f of x is smaller than or equal to c times g of x for every x greater than or equal to k. Okay, let's show an exam a couple of examples here. So, for example, three n squared plus hundred is small plus hundred is smaller than is O of n squared. Based on the definition, what this means is that there exists a c and a k such that three n squared plus hundred is smaller than or equal to c times n squared. Okay, so is this true, or how do I establish that? Well, if I look at 3n squared here and cn squared, then it immediately tells me that maybe c, I can take c to be 3, okay? 
If I take c to be 3, of course, 3n squared is smaller than or equal to c times n squared. But the problem is that I have the 100 there, right? So if I take c equal 3, I still haven't ensured that 3n squared plus 100 is smaller than c, c times n squared, because when n is 1, this is not a true result. When n is 2, this is not a true result. But if I take, for example, k to be 10, let's say, just an arbitrary value. If I take k to be 10, what happens here? So this function, 3n squared plus 100, becomes 400. And the other one here becomes 3 times 100, 300, right? So this is still not true. Well, I can make my life easier by saying, okay, let me not replace the c equal 3 by c equal 4. If I take c equal, c equal 4 now, what happens? 3n squared, the 3n squared plus 100, smaller than or equal to 4 times n squared. And if you take n to be, the k to be 10, well, this is, this is 400 when x is 10, for example. And this is 400 when x is when when n is 10. If you go beyond 10, you will notice that 4n squared is going to be now larger than this. So if I take k equal 10 and c equal 4, then I guarantee that 3n squared plus 100 is smaller than or equal to c times n squared for every n greater than or equal to k. Okay. So this is how I established that. 3n squared plus 100 is O of n squared. I can show it also the same way for 5n squared is O of n cubed. I mean, this is even easier here. If you look at them, yes, the cube function, the cubic function n cubed is going to grow faster than n squared. But you really need to show, you need to show some constant c and k such that 5n squared smaller than or equal to c times n cubed for every n greater than or equal to k. One easy, the easiest choice here is to take c equal 5 and to take k, for example, to be 1. Of course, 5n squared is going to be smaller than or equal to 5n squared, n squared for n greater than or equal to 1. This is a trivial result here, right? So when you look at these two functions, 5n squared and n cubed, it's easy to come up with these, with these constants. Now, Keep in mind, these constants are not unique. You can come up with so many, an infinite number of pairs of such constants. n squared is not O of n. I cannot bound n squared from above by n times a constant, because no matter what constant you choose, at some point, n squared is going to cross that c times n. Okay, So there doesn't exist... There, sorry, let me say that here. So if we, we, there doesn't exist a C and K such that for every N greater than or equal to K, N squared is smaller than or equal to, to C times N, okay? So the, this is the negation here. There doesn't exist C and K such that for every N greater than or equal to K, N squared is smaller than or equal to C times N. And how do we prove this? Prove by contradiction. By contradiction. Okay. So we say let, for example, let C and K be two arbitrary constants. Constants. If they are two arbitrary constants, then I need to show, I need to show and we need to show, you know, at least one, at least one n greater than or equal to k, such that n squared is not smaller than or equal to c times n. Okay. Now, if you if if we if we assume n squared is smaller than or equal to c times n then basically we are saying that n squared minus cn is, or actually, let me erase this here. I can divide both by n. This basically tells me n is smaller than or equal to c for every n greater than or equal to k, right? 
I can divide by n here because I can take k is a non-negative, is a, is a positive constant, so the n cannot be zero. I can divide by n. So what does this tell me? Look at this here. For all n greater than or equal to k, n is smaller than or equal to c. Is this possible? Is it possible that all the n's from, you know, from k all the way to infinity are smaller than some constant? The answer is no. This is a contradiction. This is a contradiction. Okay. So I cannot find a constant c to bound all the positive integers by. And this is why this is impossible to have n squared being O of n. This is how we would prove that f is not O of n. Okay, so big O bounds a function. When I say f is big O of g, then it means g times a constant from some point all the way to infinity, c times that, uh, that uh, function g will bound O from above. And there are many other results that you can actually prove on your own. One, for example, the constant function 1 is O of log n, log n is O of n, n is O of n log n, and so on. So these are, uh, you know, very useful results to keep in mind. You should be able to prove them on your own, okay? Another asymptotic notation, which is the, the flip side of the less than or equal, is the asymptotic greater than or equal. So here we are talking about big omega. We say that f is big omega of g if I can bound f from below by c times g, okay? So here, if I have this function and I can come up with another function g, so this is g here and this is f, then I say that f is bounded from below by c times g. Okay, I can multiply this always by a constant. Remember again, the constant could be one half, one third, and so on. So for example, if I look at n, it is omega of n. n is omega of one. n is not omega of n squared, right? So I cannot bound n by, from below, by n squared. You cannot find a constant that you multiply c times n squared, and somehow c n squared will be smaller than or equal to n for every n greater than or equal to k, okay? So this is for lower bound, and we use this when we talk about, for example, we wanna say the algorithm takes at least a certain running time. If I wanna say the algorithm takes at least n squared, I can say the running time of the algorithm is omega of n squared. If I want to say this, this problem, problem x, cannot be solved by an algorithm in less than n cube time, I would say problem x cannot be solved in, in less than omega of n cubed. Okay, so omega is for a lower bound, big O is for an upper bound, and we have a third notation, which is big theta, which is asymptotic equal. Okay, so if, if I want to talk about f being smaller than or equal to g in terms of order of growth, I say f is big O of g. If I want to say f is greater than or equal to uh, g in terms of growth, I say f is omega of g. Okay, we have less than or equal, we have greater than or equal. What about equality, asymptotic equality? That's what the theta is for. So if you have a function, if you have a function f, f, and then you have this is c1 times g. This is actually based on my definition. This will be c2 times g, and this is c1 times g, and this is f here. So if you can sandwich f between these two functions, the, between the, the same function g, but multiplied by two different constants, c1 g and c2 g, then we have f being theta of them. And this is actually a very powerful concept here. This is when we say, that f and g have the same order of growth. So for example, 3n squared plus 7n plus 1 is theta of n squared. Okay, you can bound it from above and below. What does this mean? That 3n squared plus 7n plus 1 is smaller than or equal to some, c, say, some constant c2 times n squared, but also greater than or equal to c1 times n squared for every n greater than or equal to k, okay? So this is the asymptotic equality. For big O is asymptotic less than or equal. 
big omega is asymptotic greater than or equal, big theta is asymptotic equality. Okay, and going back to this one, to this uh, figure here, I can say take any function and look at what it is bounded by. So for example, n squared is big O of two to the n. I can say that n factorial is omega of two to the n. n factorial is of course omega of log n, okay? None of these functions here, no two, two functions from these listed here is theta of the other, okay? Log n is not theta of n and n factorial is not theta of uh, 2 to the n and so on okay no no two functions are theta of of the of the other you have the functions one is o of log n log n is o of n n is o of log n log n and so on i can go from top to bottom using omega n factorial is omega of 2 to the n 2 to the n is omega of n squared n squared is omega of n log n and so on